Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's July 8th, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, Obama, the Pentagon, and Congress continue to support so-called moderate terrorists in Syria, this time paying $9 million to train Syrian rebels. Plus, Christians are being denied their First Amendment rights by refusing to cater to gay weddings. And a third of Americans do not know what the First Amendment is. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. This morning we were awoken by the news that there had been a temporary shutdown on the New York Stock Exchange. Now they're saying that it was just nothing more than a glitch, but now people are starting to wonder if a hacktivist group may have had something to do with it. Now we have the article, Hackers Hinted at Stock Market Turmoil, hours before the Wall Street shutdown. And this talks about how the group Anonymous said that they had concerns there may be possible issues on Wall Street Tuesday evening, nearly 12 hours before the alleged glitch. And we can take a look at the anonymous tweet. Wonder if tomorrow is going to be a bad day for Wall Street. We can only hope. And for more on this, we go to a special report from Leanne McAdoo. The New York Stock Exchange was temporarily shut down today due to an alleged technical issue. The suspension of trading, however, has fueled concerns whether other factors influenced the decision to pull the plug. Right before the shutdown, Chinese stocks collapsed plunging 20% from a May high, its most since the 2008 financial crisis. Overall, China's stock market plunge has wiped out around $3.2 trillion since June 12th. China's government swiftly moved into plunge protection mode. The Chinese government has tried to stem the decline by barring the sale of stock by company officials and people who own more than 5% of a particular company. While all eyes are on Greece, the really worrying financial crisis is happening in China. In some quarters, it's already being called China's 1929. Of course, 1929 being the year of the most infamous stock market crash in history and the start of the economic catastrophe of the Great Depression. This is important because the global economy is so dependent on China. A worldwide recession would be the likely result if China were to completely implode. So unsurprisingly, not long after China suffered these huge losses, the New York Stock Exchange temporarily halts trading due to a technical issue. Now coming up a little bit later in our show, we'll have a special report detailing how people don't know that freedom of religion is included in the First Amendment. Well, let's talk about something else that's also in the First Amendment, the freedom of speech. Now we have the article, Gay Marriage. State agency orders Christians to stop talking about their faith. So this is basically a bakery that refused to make a wedding cake for a gay couple. And it says now they're being ordered to pay $135,000 to the couple saying that they have emotional damages for not having their cake baked. But it's also interesting that they're being ordered to cease and desist the bakery from talking about their faith. So when we talk about people's marriage rights or lack thereof, whatever you want to call them, we also have to remember that people have a right to a First Amendment of freedom of speech. So you're saying that this, uh, this bakery in their own facility can no longer talk about their faith. Well, isn't that a violation of their First Amendment right? Like you want to have a gay pride parade and you want to march down the street, that's your business. But also if you're having a bakery or your own establishment, you have the right, uh, constitutionally protected right, to speak about what you want to talk about in your facility. So they're taking away somebody's rights while granting other people rights, and it's not, uh, not a good thing all the way around. It's not just because it's a gay issue. It's just any issue. Yeah, if you can say what you want to say, I can say what I want to say. You want to have your parade, I can have my parade. You can't just give rights to one group and then take them away from another. And now as we transition from that, let's talk about the state of Oklahoma, where I'm from. Now our governor, Mary Fallon, or I guess my former governor, Mary Fallon, uh, she's done some good things over the years. She passed a law saying that in a case of emergency, the feds can't come in there and confiscate guns like they did during Hurricane Katrina. And now we have this. Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon has vowed that a Ten Commandments statue on Capitol grounds, which the state Supreme Court recently ruled as unconstitutional, will remain through appeal. Coco reports. That's the local news affiliate. And basically her argument is this isn't a state monument. Yes, it's on state capital grounds, but it's being funded by independent group, being maintained by independent group, 
and thus it is not a official state endorsement of any religion. Now, people said they want to have statues of the devil, and you know they've had other things going on out there. But thus far, the Ten Commandments remain, and we'll see if that continues as the days go on. Now, let's talk about something else that has remained high, gun sales. Now, you'll see a poll here. you see a poll there. Americans hate guns. They want to get rid of the guns. And I'm always curious where these polls come from because I'm like, nobody asked me. And they said, you want to keep your guns? I said, oh, hell yeah, I want to keep my guns. And now we see that, that everybody else is getting in on the action as well, or at least enough people, because now even CNN is reporting that you had a huge spike in gun sales in the month of June. And it says we have a 11% spike in June compared to the last year, making this the busiest June ever. And this is according to the FBI's own background check data. Because that's what I'll tell you. Well, we asked, you know, 10 people in, you know, this state that hates guns, you know, how they feel about guns. And 9 out of 10 said they hate guns. But if you actually look at hard numbers, you look at sales figures, you look at the FBI background checks, you can see that the gun sales are up and in high demand. And as we're speaking about CNN, a former CNN anchor was very appreciative of the Second Amendment here recently when they had to use a firearm to protect their lives. Russell tells it like this. She says the robber got angry when the couple took too long to gather up everything he wanted to steal, and a shootout started between the robber and DeCaro. Her husband ended up shooting and killing the robber. DeCaro was shot three times but is expected to live. Police have been said if they believe the robber randomly picked the well-known couple or if he was targeting them for some reason. While Russell is shaken up, she wants everyone to know her husband is a hero. Now, oftentimes when we talk about firearms, people will point out the city of Chicago, which, yes, does have a very high ratio of gun violence. But you have to understand these crimes most often are committed around gangs and drugs, people who have committed multiple felonies before they ever pull the trigger. And now we have a story, a sad story out of San Francisco of somebody who was deported multiple times before he ended up taking somebody's life. Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com. Now, a law enforcement official says that the weapon used in the shooting death of a woman in San Francisco this past week belonged to a federal agent. Now, this is the bizarre twist in a case that has become already a flashpoint in this country's debate over immigration. Now, time and time again, InfoWars has gone to the border, shown you that it's wide open. We've shown our federal agents purchasing tickets to get these illegals bust to parts unknown around America. And then one of the things we were talking about as well is how they're not being documented whatsoever. They're not being properly processed. They're not showing up to their court dates and are just essentially being left out there unwatched, not knowing what's really going on. And a lot of these people are felons, much like with the case with Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez, who had been deported five times back to Mexico and is suspected of living in the United States illegally when Catherine Steinle, 32, was gunned down last week while on an evening stroll with her father along San Francisco's popular waterfront area. Now, federal officials transferred Sanchez to San Francisco's jail in March to face a 20-year-old marijuana charge after Sanchez had just completed his latest prison term for illegally entering the country. But, you know, you get people in, uh, up in Washington saying, oh, it's okay, these guys are great members of our society, and I'm sure that there's a lot that are. But there's a lot who aren't, and we need to crack down on those people. Now, the San Francisco sheriff cited that the city is a sanctuary city and released Sanchez in April after prosecutors dropped the drug charges, despite an Immigration and Customs Enforcement request to hold him for federal authorities to go into a deportation proceeding. Now, Sanchez pleaded not guilty Tuesday to a first-degree murder charge. He told two television stations who interviewed him in jail that he found the gun used in Steinle's killing wrapped in a shirt on the pedestrian pier she was walking on. Sanchez said that the gun went off in his hands, and his public defender, Matt Gonzalez, said Tuesday that the San Francisco woman's death appeared to be accidental. Now, is this another case of gun walking or letting guns walk or simply just another mistake of a federal agent just happened to leave his firearm somewhere and a illegal alien just happened to pick it up and shoot and kill someone. Uh, well, we do know that gun walking was a tactic used by the ATF, which ran a series of sting operations between 2006 and 2011. This is where the ATF purposely allowed firearms dealers to sell weapons 
two illegal straw buyers hoping to track them back to Mo Mexican drug cartel leaders and arrest them. Now, these operations were done under the umbrella of Project Gunrunner, a project intended to stem the flow of firearms into Mexico by interdicting straw purchases and gun traffickers within the United States. Now, during Operation Fast and Furious, the largest gun walking probe, the ATF, monitored the sale of about 2,000 firearms. Now, of that 2,000, only 710 were actually recovered as of February 2012. A number of those straw purchases have been arrested and indicted. However, as of October 2011, none of the targeted high-level cartel figures have been arrested. Guns tracked by the ATF have been found at crime scenes on both sides of Mexico and U.S. border and the scene where the United States Border Patrol agent Brian Terry, where he was killed in December 2010 by one of those guns. Now, we have to continuously keep going down to the border, showing people this proof that the border is wide open. The fact that our government is shipping this in, this is a planned event. This doesn't just happen by accident. This is completely done by design by the Obama administration. Once again, I'm Joe Biggs with Infowars.com and I think we should demand gun control for the government. And on this topic of guns, we recently had the president come out and say that groups like ISIS will not be defeated by more weaponry. Now we all know that United States, as well as other Western governments, have been supplying these groups uh, for quite some time. Of course, we saw very famously the airdrop grenades last year, but now we have this article from Kurt Nemo. Pentagon recruits 60 moderate Syrian rebels, paying $9 million to train each one. Last year, the Pentagon went before a congressional hearing and said it needed $500 million to train moderate rebels in fighting in the fight to overthrow the government of Assad. The money would go to 2,300 rebels who were supposedly vetted and not connected to al-Qaeda, al-Nusra, or ISIS. But as we know, we've been talking about for a very long time here at Infowars.com, these guys have sworn their allegiance to al-Qaeda, to ISIS, to these various other groups, and they oftentimes get the weapons that are meant to supposedly overthrow Assad. I'm not saying Assad's a good guy, but you're giving weapons to people who are out there cutting out people's vital organs, ripping them out like a episode of Mortal Kombat. I'll do it. You can look these things up for yourself. They're going to Christian villages and burning down the churches and running people over, uh, chopping people's heads off. We see those videos all the time. And this is what's happening when we're giving our weapons to these different type of groups. And that's why you can't just be airdropping grenades in AK-47s and all these other things and training people because you don't know exactly what they're going to do once you leave or once you leave them to their own devices. And for more on this, we have a video that we produced done by Darren McBrain called Killing ISIS. You can find the full video on YouTube on the Alex Jones channel, but here's a little snippet that backs up everything I've been saying. And after that, stay tuned for more special reports. This is the new face of evil. This is what nightmares are made of. Ruthless, cold-blooded killers on a mission to wage war, to annihilate millions of people. We are their enemy, and they will stop at nothing to destroy us. All measures should be taken in our defense, that always will we remember the character of the onslaught against us. You've seen what they're capable of doing. I mean, the internet is flooded with videos of their drive-by shootings and beheadings. They are an army of psychopaths, and they've been placed on the grand chessboard for a reason. ISIS didn't happen by accident, and they're not just some blowback of U.S. foreign policy. No, this was intentional. This is a Frankenstein created by U.S. and Saudi intelligence. They're there to destabilize the region. They've become very useful so far, basically doing Washington's dirty work. Right now, ISIS controls about 35% of Syria. All they need is a little more territory, a few more Christian beheadings, and it's on. The U.S. will finally have an excuse to invade. And this, my friends, this has been their plan all along. A seven-hour-long debate in the British Parliament has culminated in a landslide approval of UK strikes on Islamic State positions in Iraq. All three major parties backing the initiative 
The bombings could be unleashed any moment now. As of today, there's a new battle that has begun against ISIS trying to recapture Saddam Hussein's hometown of Tikrit. The town of al-Baghdadi falling into the hands of ISIS as the Iraqi army evaporates. ISIS is also fighting to keep territory in Iraq. Tonight, a fierce battle continues for Saddam Hussein's hometown of Tikrit. Iraqi forces hope to seize it to use as a base for eventually retaking the city of Mosul. This as the terror group gains ground in Anbar province, some predicting a collapse of the area within hours. In a new, slickly produced video, ISIS claims its militants are still on the streets of Tikrit, confidently fighting off the assault by Iraqi forces. On the global map, you see ISIS spreading the places like Algeria and Libya, uh, into the Far East and Indonesia and the Philippines as well. This is radical Islamic Jihad making war on Western civilization. Once again, the world is standing by doing little, while the ISIS menace grows, spreading all over the Middle East and North Africa. I am concerned about this report about Syrian rebels and the ceasefire with ISIS. Uh, Senator but that's Paul, not true. Well, it's not true. Uh, it's not true. The, uh, Whether I don't care about the report. I know these people intimately. We talk to them all the time. Tutnova says people living in ISIS-controlled areas are in fear of the harsh penalties for infringement of the stringent laws. The Islamic State terror group has reportedly executed a hundred of its own foreign fighters who tried to flee their headquarters in the Syrian city of Raqqa. We're here in the 17th Division military base just outside the city of Raqqa and we're here with the soldiers of Bashar. You can see them now digging their own graves in the very place where they were stationed. Can ISIS be defeated in this battle here? That's the big question mark. And if ISIS can't be defeated, having taken this fight now to back to ISIS, and if the Iraqi military is unsuccessful, then I think you have to look at a very different map in the Middle East. And welcome back. Do you know your rights? A basic question that I asked some Austinites yesterday. Went down to the UT campus, and I was very surprised to learn that many freshmen out there taking a campus tour knew more about their constitutional rights than some of the upperclassmen. And to that, I'd suggest maybe they get a hold of this, a pocket constitution. This is something that we have in the InfoWars shop. We put it in all of our orders. And it's a good thing to have, whether you encounter police or just any other type of situation where you may need to recall some of your God-given, but also, the, also constitutionally enacted and protected rights. So when I think about this, when I think about all the rights that we have, you know, your First Amendment, your Second Amendment, your Third Amendment, and how much these mean, it's very, you know, kind of jarring to me that they don't teach this more in the schools. You know, you need to know about all of your rights. So whether it's your First Amendment, your right to free speech, or whether it's your right to bear arms, you need to know about all these things. Let's hear what the students had to say when we asked them, can they quote the First Amendment? Uh, excuse me, we're asking people if they know their First Amendment rights. You know your First Amendment rights, bro? Okay, well, I'm glad that he does know. Excuse me, sir. We're asking people if they can name their First Amendment rights. I guess not. No, guess not? All right. That's an honest gentleman, though. Yeah. Passionate about her freedom yeah. of speech. Okay. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, religion, press. Uh, you got some money, too. Uh, hmm. I'll go to you real quick. Uh, I think it's like to overthrow the, like, not overthrow no. the government, but like protest. Religion. Like redress of grievances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We're asking people if they know their First Amendment rights. The right to text, apparently. Uh, we're asking people if they can name their First Amendment rights. Um, okay. First Amendment rights, sir? Sir? No? Hello, ladies. We're asking people if they can name their First Amendment rights. No? no? We've had so many people who have refused to comment. I guess they are trying to exercise their First Amendment right to free speech or lack thereof, as some of the cases may be. Let's see what these people have to say. How you doing, guys? We're asking people if they can name their First Amendment rights. First Amendment. First Amendment. Um, freedom of speech, freedom of? Uh, religion. OK. Um, freedom of the press. Freedom of the press. Oh, very good. We're going to be sophomores next year in high in school. High, in high oh, school. wow. First Amendment rights, freedom of speech, freedom of... <laughs> the First Amendment right? Yes, sir. Uh, freedom of speech, religion. Can you name your First Amendment rights? 
freedom of speech, freedom of religion. It's about that's well, all. Well, you I know, know, most Americans don't even know religion is included, so you are ahead of the curve. All right, good. Very good. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you have to ask me this now. All right, I'll give you one. Freedom of speech. Oh, of course. Okay. Um, freedom of religion. Uh, speech? Uh, no. Um, freedom of... I have no idea. No idea? <laughs> so, like, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Hmm? I don't know. Don't I don't know? know what is First Amendment. You don't know? Are you from... Where are you from? I'm from China. Uh, isn't that the... Uh... So Second Amendment is freedom of speech. First Amendment would be the... No. Second Amendment... I'm f an idiot. The First Amendment is the freedom of speech. Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. Freedom of the press. Freedom of the press? I Maybe. think, yes. I mean, there are other amendments. Freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of religious practice, uh, the right to carry firearms. I believe that's Second Amendment. Religion, um, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and oh, there's one last one. There's one last one. A redress for grievances. You, you did pretty well. Are you a student here at UT? Uh, yes, I'm an incoming freshman. Inco so. Wow, so she's a freshman. I think you know more than most of the uh, upperclassmen do. <laughs> Maybe. I don't do political. You don't do political? No. You do pizza, though? If you had a right to free pizza, would you get down with that one? Oh, yeah, most yeah. definitely. Now, coming up after this break, we'll talk about shark bites but first, let's talk about some sharks of the land, some pedophiles, people who think it's perfectly acceptable to prey on young children. And when I think about pedophiles, of course, we know Jimmy Savelle in his sex dungeon, many other notable pedophiles as well, Sandusky, many others. And when you think about the destruction of innocence and how these people would love to have their, for lack of a better term, desire, perversion, whatever it may be, classified as an alternative lifestyle. They'd like to say, hey, this is my lifestyle, this is my, uh, my choice, and if I want to you know, get into bed with somebody who's underage, you know, that's what they want you to believe is their business. But we all know we don't operate in such a fashion here in the United States of America. We love our children, we protect our children, and we don't want the creepy guy in the trench coat hanging out at the amusement park to uh, prey upon our children. So we say no to this, but they're going to keep pushing this and get you to accept it and some people liken it to, uh, you know, a fight for marriage equality. Well, it's not the same thing. Praying on somebody's child is not equality. It is pedophilia. And here's a report about that. As crazy as it sounds, a recent Supreme Court ruling on same-sex marriage may soon allow pedophiles to argue they are suffering discrimination. Using the same tactics used by gay rights activists, pedophiles have begun to seek similar status, arguing their desire for children is a sexual orientation no different than heterosexual or homosexuals, writes Jack Miner for the Northern Colorado Gazette. Miner notes that psychiatrists are now beginning to advocate redefining pedophilia in the same way homosexuality was redefined several years ago. Homosexuality was long considered a mental illness. However, in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association declassified it from a list of mental disorders. There's no cure for pedophilia, Charlie, because pedophilia isn't a sickness. Let's be absolutely clear. There's something in the brain of a pedophile that's different from what's in the brain of a non-pedophile. Be able to make a much more direct contact with these people when we indicate to them that we know that they didn't choose this. We know that uh, uh, they really had no, uh, no opportunity to select what they're gonna be attracted to. More recently, a self-described organization of minor attracted people before you act held a symposium proposing a new definition of pedophilia in the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental health disorders of the apa before you act and other pedophile advocacy organizations cite an apa issued report claiming that the negative potential of adult sex with children was overstated and that the vast majority of both men and women reported no negative sexual effects from childhood sexual abuse experiences in 2013 california congresswoman representative jackie spear a democrat proposed federalizing a state law prohibiting counseling to change a person's sexual orientation the bill according to critics defines pedophilia as as a sexual orientation and would afford the same rights granted to homosexuals. This language is so broad and vague, it arguably could include all forms of sexual orientation, including pedophilia, said Brad Dacus, president of the Pacific Justice Institute. It's not just the orientation that is protected, the conduct associated with the orientation is protected as well. In 2014, the New York Times argued in favor 
of civil rights for pedophiles. Margot Kaplan wrote for the newspaper that around 1% of people sexually attracted to children must hide their disorder from everyone they know or risk losing educational and job opportunities and face the prospect of harassment and even violence. This is essentially the same argument used to mainstream homosexuality. Representative Paul Stamm handed out a two-page list of definitions of sexual orientation, comparing it to incest and pedophilia. It was so offensive. I've never really seen anybody make such a blatant ignorant statement and then try to support it with a document. Brandon, who represents Guilford County, is openly gay and says Stamm's comments were painful. It's hurtful that you would compare me personally um, and um, to a pedophile. In point of fact, writes Michael Brown, all the principal arguments commonly used to normalize homosexuality have been used to normalize pedophilia and pederasty. Jerome Corsi, writing for World Net Daily, is concerned pedophilia will become the next sexual rights revolution. Corsi points to the normalizing of sexual pathology that occurred following research by Alfred Kinsey and the Kinsey Institute into sexual variations. Corsi cites Judith Reisman in her 2010 book Sexual Sabotage. Our laws are no longer based on Judeo-Christian morality, but on Kinsey's immoral morality. An adulterous, fornicating, aborting, pornography-addicted, masturbating, impotent, sadistic, masochistic, bisexual, homosexual, exhibitionist, voyeuristic, and child sexual abusive world, she wrote. These truths are difficult to accept, yet crucial. Americans must come to understand what has gone wrong and how we can change from a family-oriented and flawed but honorable country to a sex-obsessed and violent one. I'm saying that there are people that were the people that did this to both me and Corey yeah. that are still working, they're still out there, and they're some of the richest, most powerful people in this business. And they are And they do not want me saying what I'm saying right now. Are, are you saying that they're pedophiles? Yes. And that yes. they're still in this business? Yes. Wow. And if Washington doesn't have enough to talk about these days, the Washington Times reported today that unidentified White House aides in the Carter, Reagan, and Bush administrations now are being investigated for using the services of a call boy ring. The paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. John Bound for Infowars.com. I'm Ken Moran reporting for Infowarsnews.com. I'm here on the beautiful Carolina Grand Strand reporting to you today about the shark bites that have been occurring in the Carolinas. As a shark researcher from South Carolina, I wanted to give you more of an expert coverage on this issue. As far as the bites go, there are generally three types of shark bites on human beings. In an interaction, it can be an investigative bite where the shark is actually attempting to bite a human being just to see what they taste like. An accidental bite where the shark is going for some other food and accidentally the person gets in the way and the shark bites the human. And the third being actual attacks on human beings for the purpose of feeding. That was Ken Moran, the shark wrangler. And he's going to tell us today why shark attacks should be referred to as shark bites and how they're not as prevalent as some people would like you to believe. Thank you for joining us today, Ken. You're glad to be here, Chikari. So before we get into all the data, just give the people a brief history or overview about yourself and how you became the shark wrangler. <laughs> I started out at the University of South Carolina, which was the second ranked university in marine biology um, back in my original college years. And when I realized I'd probably be working in a lab killing shrimp from an oil company, I went ahead and changed majors, went into education and left that field. Later, when I returned to the university, they were opening aquariums here in South Carolina and I come third generation commercial fisherman. So I saw the opportunity to actually do field work with sharks. So I jumped on it, <clears throat> spent another two years of preparation, training more in aquaculture and everything else to understand how to keep them alive, transport them and everything else, and apprenticed under my uncle who taught me how to catch sharks. Very good, very good. So I'm watching this video that you put out just the other day. And I'm thinking about movies like Jaws and, of course, the recent shark attacks that we've seen, very high profile, just here recently. But from the research that you have, you say that while shark attacks do occur, they're not as prevalent as some of the media would have you believe. Is that an accurate statement, Ken? Oh, definitely. Tell us about your research. How you know, often do you think these things do occur? Well, to, to my bona fides, to qualify me on the ability to speak on this issue, now, I'm not a shark bite 
expert like George Burgess of the International Shark Attack Files. However, my specialty is working in the nurseries in South Carolina and collecting sharks. I can, you can drop me anywhere in the world, I'll find you a shark if they are there, and I transport them live. So my expertise comes into play in this situation because I know where the sharks are, I know what species should and shouldn't be there and are there by my own collection data, and I'm having to factor in all the different factors that affect shark movement because that's how I know where to go to find them and not spend a month looking for one fish. Mm -hmm. So when you're so out that, there in the beach, and not to cut you off, Kim, but just when you're out there on the beaches and you're talking about even if you're in waist high and even neck high water and you're around a bunch of sharks, you know, what is the likelihood that you could be attacked or even, as you said in your video, maybe a, a curiosity bite? They just want to test you out, see what you are and see how you taste. How likely is that to happen? Not likely at all. Not very. Jakari, when you're in ankle deep water, I, I, I'll, I'll share a little anecdote for 20 seconds. When I used to collect bonnet head sharks in my favorite bonnet head honey hole, it was on a drop off that went down 20 feet and went straight up this ridge right up to the edge of the beach. And I would sit there and watch those little brats swim up from the deep water, up into two inches of water, chasing shrimp and fish and nailing them at the surface. They were coming into two and three inch water. Then I've seen them beach themselves and I've seen other larger sharks beach themselves chasing just like you would see a killer whale coming in and taking a seal right off the beach. So when you're in ankle deep water, there are sharks around you. As you get into any kind of deeper water up to knee deep, they're there. And the fact that most people are clueless, I asked one woman on the beach the other day, did anyone tell you that the sharks are out here right now? And she goes, no. I said, man, there are hundreds, if not a thousand sharks right on this beach right now. And no one's being attacked. And she was, she was frightened. She was horrified by it. But that's how uh, comfortable are uncomfortable the sharks are with us that they don't come in and take humans on a regular basis especially in the carolinas exactly exactly it's just you know kind of i guess the fear that's perpetuated through the jaws movie and kid i definitely want to give you the floor to say what you have to say but you did say something in your video i thought was very interesting you talked about a preservationist versus a cons conservationist can you just briefly break that down for our viewers well conservation is supposedly the goal of all of us in in management departments like the Department of Natural Resources, that's supposed to be their goal. And it is to maintain, as a farmer maintains their livestock, the natural resources of our state and not to over collect or overfish or do things that negatively impact the populations. That's conservation. Every person in the world should be for conservation. That's what uh, responsible users of this planet are all about. Now, preservation is completely different. That's what we're seeing now, especially in certain bureaus in NOAA is completely shutting down entire fisheries and completely protecting certain species. Now, there are times when they've warranted it by pointing out that the bald eagle, and I believe you could track back if you research it, that that were actually a bounty was paid by the federal government to hunt them at one point. But once they were hunted to near extinction, they put a moratorium to bring them back. So for a period of time, it's preservation. We have a current preservation program on alligators in South Carolina that's now coming to an end, thank God, and on uh, sturgeon. But there's uh, times when the population gets so low, we put bans on them. But that's not preservation. That's trying to bring back conservation. So we are for conservation, but not preservation. Blindly protecting one species inevitably upsets the balance of nature and leads to the destruction of other species or the environment. Okay, so that's in regards to things of fishing or, you know, hunting. No, I guess you don't hunt too much in the sea, do more fishing, but just things of that nature. So Ken, with exactly. the time we have left, I definitely want to give you the floor, as much time as we have left. Just talk to us about the shark attacks or shark uh, interactions, whatever the proper term may be, and what people need to know about them. Well, attack is a sensational word. Everybody loves attack. I don't. It's shark bites. I don't want, and it's funny, I've already seen an article stating that the North Carolina officials are ready to kill aggressive sharks. Well, how did they know what an aggressive shark is? They don't have a clue what an aggressive shark is. I've had big sharks swim right by me, or as you can see, I've had sharks come right up to me. They were not aggressive. The shark on the camera right now came up to the hidden bait box that was above my head in that cage. He wasn't being aggressive toward me, though later he found that window and I had to forcibly remove him from the cage before he came in all the way and then would panic and hurt me. Mm -hmm. But he's not being aggressive. He's trying to get to the bait in the bait box. And that's the thing that we're seeing is that folks have this idea that simply because a shark is near you, it's aggressive or that it's behaving aggressively towards you. 
that's interpretive. Let's go with bites. And let's look at the North Carolina's actual 2014 International Shark Attack Files reports of their own statistics on what's happened in North Carolina. You're talking about since 1935, they have records for North Carolina. And in that, uh, from 1935 to 2014, they have a total of 52 bites on humans. 52 bites on humans. Now, North Carolina is also part of the nursery here, and certain sharks will pup up. Sharks that pup here also can pup in that area. And that's what I think is happening this year is that our water got so hot so fast that the sharks went to the northernmost parts of their range to pup out, even possibly making it to Virginia Beach, though we haven't had reports there. So you have the outer banks, which are the outer rim of these giant bays that are inside where the sharks can go and pup. And at Oak Island, they're not used to seeing bites at Oak Island, which is in the Brunswick part. But in Brunswick, in all those years, almost 100 years, they've only had nine reported shark bites. And that, that's the telling thing. They've only had three fatalities, one in 2001, one in 1957, and their first recorded one in 1935. Now let's look at the South Carolina the statistics. We've had six, uh, we recently had another bite, I think last week. We have, in, since 1837 to 2014, we have only 82 shark bites on humans that are documented. That's very interesting, Ken. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off, Ken. But tell the people with the time we have left uh, how they can keep up with your work. I believe you have a website, correct? The Shark Wrangler? Yes, sir. You can go to sharkwrangler.com, and I've, I'll be posting more videos and reports. And I have the warning tips that are going to be the same as the International Shark Attack Files uh, warnings on how to avoid it. There's some good common sense, good judgment things you should always do when you're out in the ocean. But you shouldn't be panicking or afraid. You're more likely to be harmed. Um, by a lightning uh, strike or, or something of that nature. Exactly. Well, in this state, you're actually more likely to be shot by a police officer than you are to get bit by a shot or, or <laughs> I a think that's or, uh, I think that's shark. for a lot of the country. Well, thank you so much, Ken Moran. We look forward to your videos, and please continue to make them. Thank you, Jakari. All right, thank you, Ken. Now stay tuned because after this break, we'll have Harry Dent. He was on the Alex Jones radio show today talking about how one of his predictions came true. And as our show draws to a close, we want to remind you of our sister show, the Alex Jones Radio Show. And if it's one thing that a program is known for, it is very bold predictions. And one of our guests, Harry Dent, came out with a very bold prediction that is not only coming true, it has happened. He joins us right now, harrydentresearch.com or harrydent.com. Wow, Harry, well, you called it uh, over and over again for how many years that it would be China? And I think this signals, maybe I'm wrong, the beginning of uh, massive correction that you've been warning of. So speak about China, what you think's going on with the U.S. stock market, the, the uh, New York Stock Exchange being closed. Do you agree with me? Do you have any intel? And then what's the next shoe to drop? Well, you know, China led the last breakdown in, in late 2007, 2008. It was ahead of the U.S. markets. And we've also been warning people, Alex, that you've got, you've got to get out of these bubbles early because the first crash is typically 30 to 40 percent within a month or two and people don't have time to get out they say well i'll get out when it starts to weaken no it's too late when it happens in a bubble like this and i, I there's, there's going to be a round of things we got to look for i think the chinese market will probably bounce pretty soon they're doing some pathetic just desperate things they stepped in this weekend with 20 billion dollars and bought stocks to prop them up artificially they told all major pension funds in China they cannot sell stocks. They can all, only buy them, they can't sell them. Talk about manipulation of the market. Um, and, and, and now 40, you know, 40 of their top companies are not even trading because they can't afford to keep falling. So at some point, we'll see this first wave down. And what people should look for is you get a bounce and it only lasts a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months, and then China starts heading down. Uh, the next thing we see, Greek is in Greece is in trouble, Puerto Rico's next, then Portugal, uh, Chicago and Illinois are in trouble, but I've been warning on this show that the, the first real critical thing to happen and watch for in the United States is oil drops again, and it's already dropped from 62 to 51 bucks in a few weeks, and, and that triggers a, a, a round of defaults with the fracking industry. The fracking industry is a trillion dollar investment, has created tons of jobs, and has 600 billion of, of high-risk, high-yield 
Um, I know a bunch of people that are in the oil industry, low-level, mid-level, small company owners. They're all fighting bankruptcy or going bankrupt as we speak. How bad is this going to wound Texas, Oklahoma, the Dakotas, uh, and Canada? It's going to particularly hit Texas, North Dakota, and, and Alberta, and Canada, because that's where most of this is concentrated. And again, most of these uh, frackers and, and oil sands people can't uh, can't break even um, unless oil's over eighty dollars or at least over fifty five. I right. think it's going to ten to twenty in the next next several years. So this is their what they're doing is they're pumping their existing wells to the max to create cash flow because their wells are, are is not it's not expensive to pump. It's expensive to find the darn things and drill. And they were only able to do that with the cheapest junk bonds in history because of quantitative easing and artificial stimulus and high oil price. So, so that's the next thing to hit the United States. But here's the real thing. The, the, the biggest bubble in China is not the stock market. It, by the way, it went up 160% in less than a year and has fallen near 40% here in just a matter of a month. But, but the Chinese save way more money than us. They have no social net and welfare and stuff. And they've always saved more because they've been poor. And even the rich save 75% of their income, the everyday 55%. And guess where they put it? They put it mostly into real estate, way more than the U.S. or Europe. So real estate, the reason the stock bubble happened was in the last year, real estate finally started to cave, but the government's been supporting that and propping that up artificially. They've been buying empty condos like crazy. But when real estate stopped going up, then people started speculating in stocks, which the Chinese don't normally do. And that's why they got such a crazy bubble when two thirds of the new accounts were opened by people who didn't have a high school education. So this is really dumb money and that's why it's failing so fast. So, but it's when the Chinese real estate market finally gets hit harder, like Singapore has recently here. Boy, when that happens, the implosion of wealth in the second largest and fastest growing country in the world is going to be unbelievable. It's going to be like the Japanese in the early 90s when their real estate sure. bubbles imploded. They stopped buying real estate everywhere, and they were the lead buyers in, in the key cities. So, so, so you're saying, I mean, to be specific, you're saying you think we'll have a dead cat bounce out of China and for a few yeah. months, and then as we go into the fall, uh, you, you think it's going to go down? Yes. Yeah. And, and same thing with we've, we've had a dead cat bounce in oil. It's starting to go down. When oil gets back in the low 40s, people are going to realize these frackers are dead and they're going to have to default. Everybody's listening to T. Boone Pickens and people saying, oh, oil will be back to $80 before you know it. It's not going to be. The leading experts and then princes in Saudi Arabia said we will never see $100 oil again. And I agree with that, at least for many decades. I don't know about ever. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, China bubble bursting and, and the fracking bubble bursting are the two biggest things I sure, see. Here's my question, and, and almost everything you said has been right on for 20 years, but, but, but here's my concern. I get that we're going into a depression, people retiring, less money, debts are huge, that causes a real economy, depression prices should fall. But things are so rigged, and they're still going ahead with QE Unlimited all over the world, I, I don't see how down the road other commodities like gold and silver don't go up especially when so many elitists and institutions are quietly buying gold or is that not as an investment just as an emergency backup yeah but they're, they're doing emergency buying of stocks and it didn't work in 1929 for long and it's not going to work in china but down the road commodities are going to be big and i think i do see gold at 5,000, but it's like 15 to the 30 year, 20 years from now we have to go through this deflation first. When, when you get a bubble burst, uh, Alex, there are $225 trillion of loans, bonds, stocks, financial assets around the globe now, and that's gone way up with these bubbles. A hundred trillion of that could disappear overnight. That is real wealth and money to people. Real estate could fall. That's not even counted, and it will Oh, fall. yeah, if people lose most of their savings and everything, it is going to be a hellish pullback. We will be yeah. in a long here's my concern. How bad will this depression be? Because I don't want to scare people, but I've confirmed the military storing food, police departments are digging in, they're getting armored vehicles delivered, that's admitted. 
Uh, I've got the Ministry of Defense and the Pentagon's own declassified reports where they believe a collapse is coming by 2017, and they said that eight years ago. So quietly, they agree with you, but how bad could this collapse be? I mean, we're talking about something far worse than 2008, aren't we? Yeah, well, it's definitely going to be worse in 2008. Every crash has been worse since 2000 crash. We had a series of crashes. And to me, you, you don't really see how bad it's going to be until you actually see debts fail and major defaults and loans going bad and, and, and 70, 80 percent crashes in major stock markets. And that's exactly what happened in the early 30s. So I think this is going to be like the early 30s. And I think it's, it's going to be much worse because governments have now kept this bubble going with quantitative easing, artificial stimulus, zero interest rates, long and short term when you adjust for inflation, they kept this thing going for six more years. The, the, it, it's like taking more of a drug to keep from coming sure. down on a high. The longer you take the drug, the worse sure. your collapse is when well, you find it. We down. can handle a couple of Detroits, but what if we have 20 of them? Doesn't this become almost a road warrior scenario in many areas? Well, it does. That's what happened. The people say Greece is no big thing. Greece is small, but it's the first major country or entity to default. And when that happens, people start looking for defaults. Oh, that next, elsewhere, and the bond markets get jittery, and interest rates go up. Well, and take a canary. A canary is small in a coal mine, but you, you watch it. It's a trigger. And again, this, the subprime crisis was the trigger for the last cr crunch in 2008. In the U.S., we triggered the whole world crisis in four states. So it wasn't that big. And, and, and the fracking industry alone is almost as big as that subprime crisis. So, so we've got a whole bunch of triggers. Whole bunch of triggers.